Hi, welcome to another episode of Coffee and Codeless with me, Gary Hogman. And today I'm joined by another incredible technology leader in the industry. And and for those just joining first time, this is a session where I bring, you know, other voices and opinions of people I've got to know, respect, and over the years. And Nick has definitely been one of those individuals, both in his previous role as well as his current role, where Nick Volpe is currently CTO at American Equity. And um, Nick, like, like I'm going to let you do your intro. I won't do it justice, but please, please tell us your story. Yeah, Gary, thanks. And uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I've been in the insurance industry for about 22 years now, usually with, you know, large global carrier first that acts equitable. Uh, spent some time in Paris working with them on an entity for annuity distribution across Europe. Um, then joined Guardian for about 12 years. Number of different roles there, you know, business strategy, and then eventually ending my career there as a technology leader there in the individual market space for annuity, disability, life insurance distribution. And I think that's where we first met, Gary, in 2015 or 16, uh, when you were first going live with Uncork and trying to figure out how to make it work at Guardian. And then uh, most recently, about almost exactly a year ago, I joined American Equity as the chief technology officer. Um, it's been a great run. It's been a great year. Uh, team is fantastic. My first time in a real Midwest city, Des Moines. It's been fantastic there as well. Um, and we're on a pretty aggressive but achievable journey. And one that I've been trying to take several times over at my other companies. But here, the flexibility, the, the ability of the team, and the age of the company being as young as it is, only 25, 26 years old, removes some of that deep 60, 70-year-old legacy that some other insurance companies have. So we're able to move more quickly and get on a two to three-year journey versus five to seven-year journey. So I'm really excited where I'm at. Again, like I said, excited to be working with Uncork and finally figured out a way to get Uncork and my insurance company working very closely together. And I, you know, Nick, that's, it's funny that you're coming from many different viewpoints, right? From a European AXA viewpoint and then to a U.S. viewpoint, Guardian. And now I actually look at American Equity, like you are operating like a startup. And that's really with the speed of a startup, like you're, you're getting things done faster than ever possible before. And like, what is the biggest difference you see? Is it a cultural? Is it a just, it's just legacy built up over time? Or what, what do you think it is? I think it's, it is absolutely, I think our CEO, Anand Bala, is definitely running a $50 billion asset or management company as if it's a startup, right? Reviewing everything as open field, reviewing our business model, you know, AEL 2.0 that he talks about with the rating agencies and our, our uh, quarterly earnings calls. The way he's running the entire company is like, hey, we can change what we're doing, we can change the industry. And he really wants to drive that change from the way we invest, the way we do our asset management, the way our distribution models work. And he understands all too well that technology needs to be in the center of that entire conversation. So when he and I first met in our interview process, we just spent almost two hours on the phone, almost already working about how we would change and how technology can support the AUL 2.0 vision. Um, and he had the business humming and it was right time for technology to come in. And like I said, the team has been absolutely fantastic. There's people that have been here, been there for years, people that have been there for one or two years, and everyone is embracing the change and excited for where we're heading. And they all believe we can move as fast as you're saying, where we can act more like a startup than the average insurance company can because of the excitement and drive of the people on the team, the business model and the way Anant views technology and its importance to the business. And then just years of trying to do this at larger companies kind of gave me the roadmap, um, working with really talented individuals like Dean Del Vecchio and Dan Johnson over at Guardian, working with guys like Kevin Murray over at AXA. They kind of showed me the roadmap, um, but the roadmap over there was 50, 60, 70 million dollars for each step. Here, it's significantly faster, more open field, and I'm just really happy of, of what we've been able to accomplish. And I think we are a year in and we have our first major release going tomorrow night of our Uncore platform for the first step in our new business journey on our suitability review. I, I love it. And and Nick, what's interesting is the drive and the culture. That's where you're, and, and not, I got to see Anand in action at the life when we were spinning up Bright House back in the day. And yep. it's a really different view. Like the, you know, to me, like they say startups, the, the word they always used was you should be hungry or starve. And they everyone thinks that that means physically, like you should be, 
you know, you know, sleeping on the couch like I did it basically. But but the reality is it's about you could get a lot done with less. Like it's always about that like smarter and, and faster and um, so I like, you know, the culture, the views, the businesses, what, for those who don't know American equity, give us, give us the, the business pitch real quick. Like what, what products, what's the strategy be great to hear. Yeah. So, so American equity has, has been, I think from the start has always been a fixed annuity, um, product distributor, mainly focused in the IMO channel, or it used to be called FMO. Um, so it's really a B2B to C business model on that side. And I think somewhere around five, 10 years ago, they started up a third party, a more traditional third party channel, which is Eagle Life, which is typical wholesaler to agents and brokers in the broker dealer channel um, and the planner channel and the bank channel to, to the clients. So really an annuity based business model through wholesale distribution, through IMO channels mainly, and then uh, an up and coming third party channel in banks and broker dealers in our Eagle Life department. That's that's awesome, and you mentioned Dean and Dan, who we we know well, and it it's um, it is amazing to see like you you learn from those leaders. Like I've definitely done that in the past, and um, and then I didn't realize the AXA before that. So I, I met you in the Guardian days for sure, but the uh, the AXA days as well. That's that's prior to their split, I guess as well. And uh, yeah, but it's uh, it's you know it's it's fascinating. What is your um, give me give me your two seconds? Where is insurance going in your your view and annuities? And where where do you see like market. I remember the conversations were always about the customer and who's the customer. And if you have the IMO channel, you have the B2B to C channel. It's always that question as to who a customer is and who do you focus on strategy. I'd love to get your opinion. Yeah, that conversation has always been interesting and it will always continue to be interesting. I think here at American Equity, we we believe everybody's our customer. So all constituents involved in the value chain are our customers, whether it be the IMOs or the distribution firms and the broker dealers or the banks the individual agents that are selling our products, but also our policyholders. I mean, that's where the final obligation goes to. So we look at it from the gamut of the constituents in the process and in the value stream. And we try to serve each individual the way they want to be served. And um, we've done an amazing job as far as service goes. You know, we won JD Power Associates. Our service center is second to none in the industry. Um, you know, hold times in other companies are 15, 20 minutes. We pride ourselves on being able to answer the phone in less than two and a half. And we wow. hear that from our distribution partners that, you know, we've been doing great. But the good news is, Gary, we're doing great there. And we have so much to do from an omni-channel perspective, self-service on the web, um, you know, chat capabilities, email capabilities. We're just scratching the surface there. And, you know, if we're this good at service and people really look to us for our service model now, I think if we truly believe meet our customers where they want to be, whether it be digital, in-person contact, we want to be great at all for all constituents. So, that conversation isn't as tumultuous here as, or as um, challenging here. We all agree at the executive leadership team that our customers are across the gamut. We don't care one more than the other. They all matter to us and we all make sure that each one is heard and represented. That's, that's amazing. That's the, you know, that sentiment of they all are the customers because you have to address each of them in their own channel and the omni-channel aspect of the pickup, drop off, wherever that might be. And like you said, meet. I, I love the expression. Um, one of the my the leaders I worked with in the past, and very well respected, had said, "Look what we've done without technology. Imagine what we could do with." And this was years ago, and I, that stuck in my head as something which I've always, you know, questioned. Is to say, "Look how far you could come without the technology, and imagine just." Like what's, that's what you're describing. It's the what's possible. Yeah. Now, now, we're going live with you tomorrow, which is exciting. And we celebrate success with you. We're going to have to do your drinks or do an event there for the teams to get this going. Tell, just what was your experience like on, with Uncork? I'm just curious, like, like, and you can be critical, of course, be, be, but like, what, what do you think of like the codeless vision where we're going and, and just opinions there? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I, I made sure that I'm not going to say anything that my enterprise architect, Curtis Lawhorn would disagree with or, or KJ who's leading up this, this first release. And we're all kind of of the same, same belief that the, the things that drew us to uncork was there really is in fact predefined fabricated bricks that you can build with uncork. It's not a purely open, so op uh, a codeless environment that you could do whatever needs to be. There are modules within there. There are things you can leverage and build off of. Um, in addition, I love the fact that you don't have our data needs to persist within your environment. Matter of fact, you came to us and said, no, leave it where it is. We want it in the original form. Let, let us use your ODS and use API calls to bring things to the forefront. 
um, a lot of other codeless environments, you know, oh, no, we need all your data. So make another copy, worry about consistency and, and making sure the data is right and replication. It's just a lot of extra steps. And when we started to really architect out the Uncork solution, we saw it as a, as a great solution for our new business platform from end to end, from suitability through app, through delivery, um, through policy print and, 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 um, and payment. But also we're mm -hmm. establishing it as our, our service, single pane of glass in our service area. So really great continuity across the platform from new business through Enforce management. So when our journey's done, we will have Uncork pretty much running the the entire gamut of our of our Enforce and our and our new business platform. So it's really exciting. And the platform itself presents a lot of great opportunity and, and some of the ideas that you have going forward are things we definitely want to leverage around, you know, looking at legacy, how can we convert legacy into it? How can we leverage the the code this environment on Cork to look at some of those things? So there's there's more to do, but we have a really good roadmap with Uncork across our, our service area. You know, it's funny, the, you know, um, when you think about when software engineering, which you described me, like there are so many companies we've seen which said exactly what you did, which is, here's the box, you fit into the box. Hey, American Equity, you got to plug into this box, the data model, store your data this way. And I've seen that with everyone from like an SAP and ERP, where it costs a million dollars per country to deploy, deploy just a simple ERP to, to you know, HR systems. To, but yeah, that's not what you need. Like you're, you're like, you've got your data, you've got it in systems, you've got it in the format you need, you speak yep. the language that you like, why do you need to change it is the, I love that, that, and that's the view, like that's why you need to be an experienced technologist to appreciate that. That's the, and and just walk me through, Nick, like your background before entering. Was was it technology? Where where did you start from? Where was school? Where did you think you'd be today? How'd you get into technology? Yeah, so my background is very interesting. And as I said, I'm probably the least technical CTO you could have on this call. So interesting you invited me to be on here, talk about codeless <laughs> environments. But my background, my college education is business administration and finance. Uh, my first job out of school was consultant at PwC. And... Up until the last five years, I'd say my career was 60-40 business versus technology, really strategy driving technology versus being in charge of execution of technology. It's really only the last six or seven years where I've been a technology leader and having to understand architecture and why it matters and cloud strategies and applications. And so I'm still learning a lot. Like I said, I made sure I called my enterprise architecture before I got on this call to make sure I didn't say anything wrong. Um, but my background is very much focused on this industry, focused on this business. I love what we do. I love the promises we make to our clients, right? Um, you know, where else could you go that someone's going to say, you give me your money now and I promise you income for the rest of your life. Or when I was in the life insurance space, you know, when, when your family is in the worst position they could possibly be in, we give them one less thing to worry about. So the promises we deliver in this industry are second to none. And I think it's something we should all be proud of. So I'm happy I dedicated 22 years of my career to this industry and what we do. Um, and I'm just excited about how technology can change it. You know, there's, there's terms in this industry that drive me crazy, like client onboarding or application entry, right? In the rest of your retail life, you just buy stuff, right? So our products need to be available to the masses. And the current way we do things just don't promote that, right? Um, I think with agents will never go away. They will always be part of this conversation. But it should be a simpler buying process. And I think that's where you start to become part of every financial plan versus 5 to 10% of the agents out there have to deeply understand annuities and know how to fill out an application, 46 pages, and what the regulations are. We need to work hard to streamline so that these products are available and in every conversation and every financial plan, which is why I really dedicate myself to the technology to support the industry that I'm so proud of. You know, it's interesting, Nick. So the, um, to me, the lines between tech and business are, have been blurred. They, they're getting clearer in my mind. That's why we love the idea of we're business-led IT, which is, that's, so in my, in my view, like I started coding on the trading floors next to the trader and like my income was based on their income. Like you knew the, and you were, there was no CIO function. There was no CTO function. There was no tech function. There was, you were in the business. And I think with regulation, we stood up whole, you know, we have, we have banks saying they have 35, 50,000 engineers, you know, more than Microsoft and, but they're a bank. 
And when you think about that, like the, the lines are blurring again, where I see business leading IT because business sets requirements, business sets the goals, the strategies, the funding, and like you have to have that business knowledge. So like to me, we're going to see a lot of technology leaders become business leaders and it's going to be back and forth where hopefully we get to the point where there's no bureaucracy between the two. There's no, there's no, there's no division between the two. And, uh, and by the way, you, you mentioned Des Moines, like I got it, like Des Moines to me has a special place in my heart. So there's the Fung's pizza, which is amazing with your, you put your football helmet on and get a kamikaze shot, which we've done. And, <laughs> and uh, I think what crab rangoon pizza is what it is, but, but it's such a different culture out there. Like, so it is, I got to ask just from a cultural point of view, like, um, and my example, Nick, is when I left the city group to join MetLife, I will never forget. For, I remember going to my boss after 30 days and saying, why is everyone smiling at me and what do they want? Like, this was the, and he's like, he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, 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 actually like in, in city no one smiles unless they're going to stab you behind your back the second you turn around like that was kind of the culture i lived yeah. and so i realized it was a midwest culture even though new york city fortune 50 firm like what do you think about the culture from like des moines new york i'm curious i think it's great like i said i mean my team in des moines is is the best team i've had one of the best teams i've had the people are embracing change and you know as an arrogant New Yorker, sometimes you think New York is faster pace and we do more. And right. I've been proven wrong as I've spent time there. There are some super talented folks on my team that have taught me a lot. You know, they built a massive business, you know, billions of dollars a year in sales, $50 billion of asset center management. So I've learned a lot about the culture and I, I truly appreciate the authenticity of the people. Um, they're not afraid to speak their mind. You know, we have an open door policy with my leadership team all the way up to a not. Um, and, it's been great. And as I said to, I was talking to somebody earlier, traveling from New York to Des Moines has gotten easier and easier. It's one of the best places to get through. Um, the airport's simple. I'm there every other week. Um, but it's just, it's, it's a, it's a refreshing change from the New York mentality and some of the, the more, I don't want to say cutthroat because that's too harsh of a word, but more of the fast pace, you know, looking at, you know, the short term and the tactical stuff, you, they really allow you to kind of think through things and spitball ideas and, um, it's just, a, it's just welcoming, right? Like I said, I was a new guy a year ago and they all could have turned a different way on me. And, and it was a, the complete opposite. It was 180 of what I expected. It was, this is awesome. Let's continue. And they've moved the ball faster than I could even expect. So kudos yeah. to the culture. And I, I truly appreciate the people that are there and the way they support and the way they, they, they work. Yeah, that's um, and we're seeing that as a you know one of your partners. Like we see how fast you move and push, and that's I I always question why can't it be done on the other firms? Why is it like so? And it could be right. It's just there's there's just a top down mentality. There's a lot of a lot of CEOs that bang their hands on the table and say that's what we're going to do, and no one will disagree. There won't be any. It'll be that's where we're going. Everyone's going that way, even if they all know it's the wrong way. And I've I've seen that so many times myself, and it's. Um, you know, it's, it's, I like the word 10th man in the room concept, which is, is should always be someone there, no matter what they believe is going to just give an alternate view just so, to challenge, just to kind of keep the conversation a little bit interesting even, but that's, uh, that's amazing. And that's, and, and Nick, so like leadership point of view, what, what did anything to share with the, the listeners, anything you would say with anything that you would do different, anything decisions. And I'll, I'll give you like, in my view, there was one time where like I was offered as a, a senior engineer as leading a team back back in the nineties and they said, We want you to come lead this other group and and it was internet before anyone knew the word internet and online banking before anyone knew online banking and, and I turned it down because I felt like I was really happy with my current role. I liked what I was doing, but I didn't realize they they believed more in me than I did at that point. I never did it again. To me, that was the one time where I was like, okay, if someone gives me something, I'm going to take it and I'll figure it out later. But like any views from you, like tell me anything to share on, in your career that got you where you are. Yeah, no, I, I think you said it right, Gary. Like I, I don't, I don't always know what I'm about to step into, but I've never stepped away from a challenge. So there's a lot of new elements of this role, like, you know, being on the executive leadership team of a publicly traded company. I had never been on an earnings call before, never prepped for an earnings call before. Didn't understand the inner workings of what an earnings call really means. And when you commit to the street of a certain operating expense, that's a really big deal. And quarterly, you got to prove as to why you're a dollar over a dollar under. 
sales forecasting takes on a whole new term. All right, when you tell the street you're going to do X millions of dollars or billions of dollars in sales, every quarter you got to say, if you're even slightly off, exactly why it's happening. So that was a new experience for me. Um, Anant's brilliance of the way he looks at the investment strategy, I learned a lot kind of watching him operate and see how he built out the HTM, our, uh, our investment arm within here. Like he viewed it as an asset manager. And I don't think a lot of insurance companies view their investment arm as truly being another world-class asset manager. So under Jim Hemelini's leadership, I learned a lot there from investments. And then, you know, operating with a board that truly believed in our leadership team. You know, when I presented the three-year roadmap and the strategy, the investment was significant. It was, you know, almost 2x what they had spent on technology in the past. And wow. wow. I don't I don't want to say it was it was easy, but it was like thank you, it's about time. So having that kind of support kind of really helps deliver what you need to deliver. And, and you know, Nant's been a champion and all my peers in distribution, you know, we have two distribution leaders. Both of them have been completely supportive and in adoption and my leader in the operations organization. It's really a team effort and we really click as a leadership team. So I would tell anybody, even if you don't think you know the whole job, that's all about part of growth, right? So if you have sound leadership, listen first, understand what's going on. Don't discredit where they've been and then change from there. It's hard not to learn and thrive if you just keep those sound foundations in place. You know, I like that viewpoint. It's, I guess, it, drilling in deeper. So listen, like listening is critical and respect their past. That's what you're saying. Respect where they've been and got them there. And yep. then discuss change, discuss where we're going to get to and how we're going to get there. Like there are so many people that come in with a, a run book they've used in the past. And unfortunately that run book might've worked 30 years ago and they're still running it today. Like it's still the same run book. And like, here's what we're going to do. Step one, step two, I'm, I'm going to come in, I'll replace the whole leadership team. We'll get this done. We'll get this done. We'll get, and the reality is um, it doesn't work. It doesn't fit the culture. It doesn't fit the products or the customers or the company. And um, I like that advice. That's, that is amazing advice. That's uh, very cool. Very cool. And again, like, um, I appreciate your partnership, Nick and Drive, and I'm always there. As you have my cell phone, you could, t you of course, you call them and text me with any issues as we go live tomorrow. So um, we'll celebrate that <laughs> that success. And the fact we're one day early here doing this is even better confidence, which I love. I love the confidence. That's <laughs> the drive. Yep. But uh, yeah. and th this is awesome, Nick. And again, I appreciate you um, joining us here today and ongoing part. Looking forward for everything we're doing with you. And the whole services desktop, the sales desktop, I, I think that's um, you know brilliant strategy that we'll see play out. And exciting to to be working with you. And thank you again yeah. for joining us here. Uh, yeah, Gary, thank you so much for for letting me join you. I appreciate it. And you know, a year from now, we should probably hit replay on this thing, you and I, and, and let's, showcase. Um, you know what? Everything. One year from now, I'll bring. Let's. That's a deal. You come back on one year. We'll do a live demo and show everything we've done, and that will be an amazing place to go. I, I love it. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. I'm excited. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks everyone Thanks, for joining Gary. another episode. See you soon. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you.